Okay, good evening, people. How are you doing? Welcome to Sports Therapy uh, Association podcast. Um, nice to see you. Um, we had to change the stream at the last minute. There's, I think it's just overkill. So many people using the internet at the moment. What with COVID-19 and all that, then um, yeah, so um, I'm hoping you found us. It looks like 30 people already have found us, which is great. Um, so here we are, eight o'clock on the dot. Right, so um, if you're listening to the podcast, then thank you very much for your support. You're listening to um, a recording in that case, uh, which is great. And we appreciate it. Um, if you could leave a rating on Apple Podcasts, that would be fantastic. It helps us reach more people. But we do invite you to join us live because the Sports Therapy Association podcast is recorded live on Facebook, on the Facebook page. And you don't have to be an STA member to come along to watch us. You are welcome to come and see uh, not just our fantastic guests, but also to have a chat, see what we're about, meet the other members. Um, and generally network. It's a lovely evening, which I look forward to very much every week. Um, talking of which, if you are in here, then um, basically by coming in with Facebook, you can have your say on the screen. Uh, for example, I can say good evening to Timothy Greek, who has joined us. How are you doing? Um, the fantastic followers and faithful um, every night appearances from people like Danny Matthews. How are you doing? Catherine Reimer. Um, hey, uh, Mark Nussi is here. Becky Carroll. So yes, so if you do want to join us live, then you um, obviously can share your comments, ask questions, discuss things. Uh, your name comes up on screen. You just have to imagine that if you listen to the podcast. And um, we also stream uh, live to YouTube. So if you don't have Facebook or you don't like using Facebook, then you are welcome to watch live on YouTube as well. And you can leave comments and they will show up as well. Um, if you are watching on YouTube, then feel free to leave a comment and say hi and tell us. I've always wondered how many people watch on YouTube. So, yeah, great. Nice to see you, people. You're all still flocking in, which is fantastic. It seems you have found us, which is great news. I'm going to have to stop bringing these names on the screens. So I'm going to be here forever. There we go. Great. Good to see people. Thanks for your support. Right then. So, um, as I say, uh, we are um, a podcast um, and on YouTube. So do subscribe and uh, like us if possible. That really helps. Um, and uh, also available now. Um, is episode 34 from last week, which was our biomechanics special, um, which was really enjoyable. It was a real pleasure um, to speak to Fiona Higgs um, of Move Well and also uh, Dan Anderton from DA Human Mechanics. Um, it was really uplifting. I was really pleased. I always worry speaking to people who give courses on biomechanics because there's a lot of old school stuff out there. And anybody who knows me and my background, that kind of gets me worried because people are just concentrating all on the screening and the biomechanics stuff, especially the courses that are put out there are really, they kind of seem to forget all about the fact there's a brain attached to all these muscles and bones. But it was a, it was a real breath of fresh air to hear, to hear two people like Fiona and Dan uh, talking so openly and honestly about what we don't know about mechanics, um, but how it can serve us and really good. And I really uh, look forward to seeing how their courses go um, from members. All details are on their websites. Um, so do listen to it. And uh, yeah, totally recommend it. Really, really refreshing. So thanks, guys, for that. So tonight, very excited. Uh, we've got a topic which a lot of you have asked about. and We've been talking about it um, during the week. In, uh, on the Facebook page and in the members groups, and that is uh, the issue of mental health, which obviously has increased maybe in awareness or maybe actually physically as well um, because of COVID-19. It's a topic that um, has, has affected both patients of ours and clients, but also us as soft tissue therapists and probably everybody. Obviously, it's I'm gonna, one thing I'll be asking my um, guest um, this evening, James Chapman, is how much of it is just a spectrum? How far do you have to go around when you're worrying and worrying about COVID-19 and the fact that your money is not coming in before suddenly you're diagnosed as having a, a mental health issue? That's one thing I'm really looking forward to listening about because it does seem to me to be a spectrum. I wonder when you know that you do have to actually ask for help or how do you recognize that a patient isn't just got a right to be worried and stressed out? How do you know when actually you need to be maybe referring on or asking those questions, recognizing the triggers? So it's a topic which I think is really important um, personally. Um, and I'm sure a few people in this room will have some questions as well, judging on the debate that's been going on uh, during the week, which I've been following um, with great interest. So I will bring our guest up. Obviously, any questions you have, fire away. 
um, interrupt. I can see your comments at the side. Uh, James will be able to see your comments. He'll be able to say, stop a second. I've got something interesting there. I want to apply to so-and-so. So um, there we go. So without further ado, I will bring up Mr. James Chapman. Hello, mate. How are you doing? Hello there. Hi. Nice to be here. I'm very well, thanks. Thank How you are for you? joining us. Okay, Especially great. if I've seen you're a busy man with lots of little ones running around. <laughs> yeah, very busy. And uh, yeah, the pressures of uh, working from home um, and homeschooling and my office uh, for the morning. I, I did a live uh, online session. Uh, I think it was about four hours and I was sat on my two-year-old bed and I had a laptop and equipment set up on my bed and I was sitting cross-legged and I was all hunched over, <laughs> hunched over like that. So, uh, so yeah, it's been... Uh, okay. it's been we very... don't judge posture here, it's fine. <laughs> but I'm pleased to hear that you are stressed. There's nothing worse. There's nothing worse than getting advice for somebody for about mental health who seems to be living the, the high life with no kids and a lovely big office and going, Do you understand the problems? And I'm like, I'm glad. So I'm glad you're stressed. I'm glad you've got problems. Um, it's made me feel a lot more like I trust you more. Really. So great. Now, thanks for giving me your time. Uh, like I say, it's been something which a lot of members have asked for, both for themselves and for clients. So I'm looking forward to. Uh, getting into that into you first of all people who, who well people who haven't heard you about you to start off we'll get into mhfa later on but what's your background how did you get to where you are today okay so uh, my background um i've been a massage therapist and a yoga teacher for the last 18 years um that came about from um burnout basically i used to work in the city I worked in the city and I used to DJ, I kind of did a bit of both. I was a contractor for many years um, in the late 80s and early 90s. I used to decommission mainframe computers, I worked in IT, and I contracted all around, basically. So I did that for many years, um, earned lots of money, and spent lots of it on um, things I shouldn't have done, really. Um, and then I ended up working at a big law firm in the mid to late 90s and I used to run their 24-hour IT support team. So it's a, it a top six law firm, top six in the world, so really, really stressful job. Um, I was working um, 70 hours a week at my desk and then logging in from home um, and I just, I just went I went snap basically and um, I'd had a history of mental health problems from since I was a child um, I had a, a difficult upbringing I was um, I was adopted when I was a baby so my first year was in a, in the children's home I was neglected and that caused me some physical health problems and definitely some emotional problems I think um, I grew up as adopted as a child uh, by a white family who are great they're my family uh, nothing wrong with that definitely but um, I grew up in the 70s and 80s in a very white, quite racist area, nice area actually, I come from Windsor, I grew up in Windsor, so, um, uh, but I suffered a lot of racism and that caused me a lot of problems, so, you know, I started uh, drinking quite young and then that went into other substances and, you know, the, the alcohol uh, came from uh, depression. Um, and anxiety that I suffered as a child and you know back then you just you just didn't get any help for that at all um, but you know I was lucky I had a good family behind me I went to a good school and um, you know and I was a, a high functioning um, addict basically so I managed to um, kind of get through life just about I think the the working as a, a an IT contractor was good for me because I'd worked for six months and I just just about kind of get through that six months um, before I have a break and then I go off to Ibiza and do all that kind of stuff and then I get another contract and um, but you know I think ultimately the, the IT was something that I kind of I didn't like it's my family's business so I kind of did that trying to you know, as my, a lot of people do, trying to make their parents happy. Um, but, you know, the, the stress of doing something that you really don't like for a long period of time. Um, and then add to that the physical stress of, uh, of being on a, uh, on a computer for hours and hours and hours on my end and um and then when i wasn't doing that i was on my record decks like this for hours and hours on end um you know that caught up with me so i was i was diagnosed um with cervical spondylosis when i was 20 28 i think but i had it for a few years before then and it took people a while to um um 
to, to give me any diagnosis at all because you know as a, as a young man in my mid-20s when I, mean, I look quite young I look quite healthy and they were just like oh it's muscular here have some um, you know some ibuprofen or something like that and, and just go away uh, and then eventually I, I moved to a, a different area so I had a different doctor and she, she just she looked at me she got out, out of the seat she came down behind me she went down my spine she goes well you know it's quite clear you've got a scoliosis and I was like yeah you know and uh, and she goes so I think you've you know this is probably causing da 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 da, da. so I had the x-rays and stuff and then I got my diagnosis um, which I thought was basically I mean at the time because I was eating a lot I wasn't eating sorry I was drinking a lot I was working long hours um, I mean I used to drink a, a lot a hell of a lot and you know I, I was one of these people I'd sit and I'd turn my neck and it'd be like crack crack and I was in constant pain so I was medicating more self-medicating more to help with the pain drinking loads and loads um, this was at the time that I was working at this law firm who on some levels were really good like I had this amazing desk I had this amazing chair that back then cost like 700 quid um, they were really good with me because uh, I worked so many hours I kind of kind of ran my team so I could take time off so there's a city back pain clinic I used to go there on Monday for acupuncture Wednesday for massage Friday I'd see a chiropractor the weekend it would be at the walking back rub place or, or somewhere else for a massage so yeah I used to earn pretty good money and therapies were <laughs> bit cheaper back then um so that's how i i got into the the massage side of it so because you know massage really really helped me and it just it helped with the physical pain it helped with the mental pain and it kind of it gave me something to look forward to you know it was a really big positive um thing in my life so um so yeah so I, it kind of all, it all went bang one um christmas party basically <laughs> and i had a, I had a few words with my IT director, which didn't go down too well. And after that, I went off sick and I thought, you know, something's got to change here. Um, they were really good. They kind of, I got some psychiatric care. They put me into uh, the Priory, uh, which was, um, cost a lot of money. It, was, it wasn't the best place back in 2000, um, 2001 I was in there. So yeah, it was a bit, um, uh, like for example, I had to organize my own physiotherapist. Um, you know, I'd, I'd stopped drinking and I wanted to move my body. I was in physical pain and I was like, look, I need to move my body. I thought there was going to be a gym in there. I thought there was going to be a swimming pool. You know, back then it was like 550 pounds a day, this celebrity rehab. Uh, place and they had like a ping pong table and an exercise bike which looked like someone threw it out the you know the january before or something so you know I, li I literally just escaped one day i went to sweatshop and finch things i said i need to move and uh, and i got uh tracked in a pair of trainers and i just went running every day um so you know back then it was very much like it's in your mind but, like it's in your mind if you distract what's going on in your mind with your body um, they were not going to do the work and da, 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 da. so um, so you know that wasn't a positive experience in many ways but I did actually stop drinking um, then which is good this year will be 20 years uh, which is great and um, so then after that I thought I need to do some more work on myself I was being sent up and down Harley Street by my company because they wanted me to come back to work and I was having these um, uh, steroid injections uh, in the soft tissue around my spine to help with the pain and I had loads of those and they just stopped working uh, more and more painkillers antidepressants sleeping pills a lot and uh, and i just thought you know i can't i can't carry on like this and all of these doctors were saying you have to go back to work and all you're going to do for the rest of your life is manage the pain and then uh, i went to another uh, rehab which is great it was called the core trust in married it's no, no, no longer there but they had uh, full body shiatsu full body acupuncture was part of your weekly treatment uh, you had qigong um, they gave you a proper breakfast when you got there so you had porridge and detox tea um, if you were, behaved yourself you could get all kinds of different body therapy Indian head massage reflexology all kinds of stuff you know so for me that was that was great that was kind of because I could start to feel my body and you know one of the things with uh, uh, mental health a lot of mental health problems is people uh, get disconnected from their physical bodies you know um, and then it's this kind of cycle of stress so you know you have some physical pain this creates mental pain and mental pain creates more physical pain so you stop moving more and more and then it's um, so for me that was great and I met this Qigong teacher there so um, 
uh, you know, she runs the tiny system of, of health through movement. And uh, he just looks at me and goes, yeah, he goes, yeah, I can help you. He goes, but you know, you've got to stop taking the painkillers. You've got to follow my exercise. It's going to be really hard. You're going to have to deal with uh, the mental aspects of it because of, 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 you've been in pain for so long, even though, you know, was, the movement was there now. There shouldn't be any reason. I had lots of scans and stuff. Um, so I think I was dealing with a lot of the, the throwbacks from my diagnosis, which was actually, I think, just because of my poor posture. Um, and the fact that I was so skinny, <laughs> it was just because I didn't eat at all. So I was just skin and bones, and I think it was it was just that, you know. Um, so, you know, within a very short space of time, uh, I got my physical health uh, much better. It was, was, was getting really good. This helped with my mental health. Um, and I stuck with this program. There was a day program, a structured day program there. It was a, a wonderful place. Um, really good talking therapies as well, which is you know, a really big part of that. And then when I was there, my company said they can't hold my job open. I was like, fine, I don't really want to go back to that chaos. And uh, so they got, they said, come back and do some project management. It's great. And they got three people to do my job, which was lovely. And uh, so uh, I threatened to take them to court. And of course, they you know, gave me lots of money so that I didn't, uh, which was good. Um, and at the time, the lawyer said, if you'd have gone to a, a um, commission for racial equality you'd, you'd have retired on what they were giving you i mean I, I don't know whether there was any racial motivation to what they were doing at the time because you know the, at the city you know if they can get their pound of flesh out of you they will if they can get you to do three or four people's jobs they will i worked at a law firm lawyers work massive hours you know they like do the jobs of two or three people but the difference between a lawyer and a normal person is they earn like 400 or pounds an hour um, so yeah, so I just decided then, you know, I want to dedicate my life to, to health. I went to a place called the City Lit, um, and I was, um, you know, I studied massage there, because uh, massage is something that really, really helped me, and I, I really wanted to, um, to know a lot more about it. I got into yoga, I decided to do a yoga teacher training, uh, just because for my point of view if you want to learn something the best way to do is to learn to teach it and I had the time I had the money um, was initially going to go back to working in the city and then actually I went up to my, my physios was in Threadneedle Street and I, I went there one day and a beautiful summer's day I still remember it really vividly I came up from Moorgate Station and I love aspects of the city I love the, the history the architecture I love the buzz around it and so I was happy to be there. It was just angry people wearing very expensive clothes, just pushing me out of the way and just being really just, uh, and I just thought, I can't, can't be part of this anymore. Um, and then I, um, I, was, I, think I was working as a DJ at the time, um, started working again as a DJ. Um, but then I just started teaching yoga. Um, the massage, I did lots of trainings. I wasn't a, a, a professional massage therapist at that time, but I was training in as many um, uh, courses I could, mostly at the city lit, because you know, I basically went through my life was working a lot and then pub crawls with friends to uh, being a yoga teacher and then having lots of friends who were all massage therapists. So we were all swapping and cooking each other dinner and, and it was great. It was just a complete opposite, you know, and it was just this really nice, wholesome, healthy, wonderful place um and then eventually um you know i was teaching yoga for a few years full on i was doing really well with that and then i got a friend of mine a job at a try over where i've worked for a long time it's a big yoga center in london for those who don't know it and um and i remember i sat on the beach in india one year and it was glorious and i should have been all like on and just fantastic and i was stressed because i didn't have half a dozen yoga classes to teach and i thought well i'll just swap one rat race for another rat race um and she said become a therapist here why don't you work here and i and i did and, uh, and i've been a therapist there ever since um you know since then i've trained in sports massage um i've done a lot of work with james Earls, tom myers and till lucow as well so I've gone down the myofascial path. I don't know whether I'm releasing anyone's fascia or not. And, you know, but my aim with my treatments is to, is to give good function. I've also worked with John Gibbons as well in Oxford, who's, who's excellent too. Um, and, and in that time, I mean, when I first started as a yoga teacher, I actually brought yoga to a couple of drug rehabs. Um, 
about three or four actually in North London. I volunteer as a massage therapist at a, a rugby house, which is uh, Islington Council's residential drug rehab. Um, and that was just amazing. So I, w- I went there and I just thought I'd just do some chair massage. And I went there and there's a group, residential, you know, um, and um, no one I said, you know, who wants a treatment. Everyone was like that. And there was this Irish guy who was like a really wiry, tough builder in his 50s, you know, like lifelong kind of alcoholic. You can really see it on his face, real tough man. And he goes, well, I'll do it then. And, you know, he had some, uh, you know, some uh, movement issues with his shoulder. And, you know, I just did a little bit of mobilisation. He's like, oh, you know, I can move my arm. And, and, you know, for him, it was like a massive revelation. And then from that point on, everyone was queuing up every week for, for a treatment. And um, I studied psychotherapy at the same time, but I thought, you know, really, I want to kind of work in this field because at that time, there wasn't enough uh, physical and t- touch therapy. And if it was, it was very kind of relaxation oriented, which is nice, you know, but because there are people who have often mental health problems, there's lots of physical stuff going on. And if you can free up some restrictions in the body, you know, it has an effect on the mind as well. So, um, so I, you know, I worked in mental health for many years. Um, I've taught yoga at, um, for the NHS. Um, I also work for some very high level drug rehabs who also work with people with mental health uh, issues as well. Um, so they're all like £60,000 a week. <laughs> if you get ill, so it's really, really high level. And it's great that people can have that level of care, but it's also kind of nice to, um, you know, to work for mind and rethink there, but long association with as well. Um, and then I came across, um, oh, hello, Matt, yeah. Um, I came across MHFA a few years back, and then even though I've had lots of training um, in mental health from my psychotherapy training, from um, my training with um, I'm a yoga therapist as well. I've had lots of specialist mental health training with yoga. Um, and I did the course and I was just like, this is great. You know, and straight away I knew that I wanted to do this because like for me, I want to, to help people, you know, because um, you know, mental health services are not great. I know we're gonna speak about that a little bit later and, and it's, it's kind of really good to be able to help people in, in ways that they might not be able to get help. And the MHFA training was really wonderful. I, yeah. So I wanted to do it's that. It's interesting that, I mean, that's a real, that's a real kind of um, good testimonial for the course. If somebody with your background who had been on the receiving end of lack of service, should we say, um, with lots of people not even recognising or dealing with your posture more than what was maybe going on in your life and everything, <laughs> to actually having an, an introduction to working with people with mental health problems as well for you to go to a course and go wow this is amazing must have been that course must have been something quite special for there's someone of your knowledge already to actually commend it yeah i'm interested in knowing from what you've said so far about your personal experience which obviously brings so much to the table that you you know what it's like on both ends receiving and giving um advice when you look back to your um issues with pain and when they did look at your posture and go well this is the problem and they're giving you corticosteroid injections and all this kind of traditional stuff along for those years did anyone back then kind of address the fact that some of the pain you were feeling was to do with kind of the psychosocial stuff as opposed to just the biomedical was it something that came up when you went to see a massage or sports or physio or nhs or it was just they were fixated on your physical things they were more fixated on the physical, but actually I, I did have a really good acupuncturist with Dudley Kent and he did a lot of work more on the emotional level um, and also at the core trust, that's, that's kind of how they worked. But everyone else, it was it was mm. very much on the physical level. Um, and and he, even with the uh, psychotherapist I worked with, no one ever looked at the underlying causes of of what was going on was always um you know so at what point did you because you mentioned at the beginning that you'd you now you can look back and reflect on your childhood being um with a all-white family in the neighborhood and racism and all that is it only now that you've kind of studied more that you realize how much of influence that played on and still probably plays or back then were people talking about 
Oh, the fact you're adopted, how does that feel? How do you, were people asking you these questions, which probably today they're going to ask you about in some kind of, kind of therapy, or were they just not being asked or recognised? Or People were asking me about my adoption, and people were asking me, they were more interested in the fact that I had a white family and the problems that might cause. And I was mm. like, well, they're not the problem. It's the guys outside. <laughs> it's the skinheads on the street. Mm. And I grew up in a barrack town. So there was a, a lot of soldiers who weren't, uh, who weren't the most welcoming people of, uh, uh, at that time. And, um, and just the local casuals and, and racists. You know? So no one ever actually addressed the racism and, and that level of discrimination, wow. which, I thought, which is pretty much a daily thing. And, and it, even like now it's only actually coming out that people are looking at that and looking at that as a thing and you know i, I lecture in in the yoga world on, on racism and um you know people i think it's one of these things like I've, I've got three older sisters and an older brother who are all they're all white so they're all uh um, this, my sisters are all natural children my brother's adopted as well but uh, he's white uh, but my sisters i'm close to them and actually one of my sisters who i'm closest to uh, just recently, after George Floyd, um, she said to me, she goes, James, I'm really sorry. She goes, I never knew all that stuff that you went through because my mum told her about the hassles that I had with the police. Mm. And she goes, I just thought you were just white. Because <laughs> well, I was a bit white, but, you know, there is a reason for it, you know. And, yeah, which came you know, first, the racist or the wildness, yeah. Yeah, so it's... Oh, uh, fascinating. I mean, so these days, I mean, hopefully... If some if if somebody like yourself twenty years ago or so walked into a clinic and and they actually asked the right questions during the subjective, then I'd cover a lot more. If you came in as a person in pain and looking for a massage, um, hopefully they'd uncover a lot more than they did back there twenty years ago. Yeah, which exactly. brings us on to like the content. So I've I must admit, and I've no, I thought for a second, or oh, do I say this out loud publicly? But I think it's quite important the fact that I like to think I mix in circles of quite a few therapists and keep my ear to the ground. But I hadn't actually, me personally, I hadn't actually heard of the MHFA before, which um, might be my ignorance, but also it makes me think how come when I'm looking at CPD and I'm looking at social media and I'm looking at all these people advertising, um, you know, CPD for therapists, why haven't I seen it up there? Why hasn't it been in highlights? Why don't I know about it, basically? Um, is it something which is getting more awareness during COVID or do you think it's still not given it's, the attention which you think it should be? Mental health in general is getting more uh, attention now because of COVID, quite rightly. Um, but I think with the MHFA, the Mental Health First Aid, pre-COVID, it's one of these things, thank you, Becky, um, it's, it's one of these things that uh, unless you're really interested in mental health and have a direct involvement in that, you might not have known about it. Um, so Mental Health First Aid has been around for a while, and uh, thanks, Matt. <laughs> it was a pleasure to have you. I want to speak to you, actually. Um, yeah, it's been around for a while. And listening to the podcast, I'm just bringing up comments from people in the room who are showing a lot of love um, <laughs> yeah. for James here. That's why it's saying thank you quite a few times. There's a lot of people who seem to have done courses with you. Yeah, sorry, yeah. continue. So, um, yeah, so it, it's one of these things that just doesn't, um, uh, it just doesn't get the attention that it deserves. Now people are talking more about mental health and there's still a huge uh, stigma around mental health, which is one of the aims of, of mental health first aid um so yeah it's it's, it's something that's it's, it's coming up now but it's just still uh it's still not enough of it and in the in the therapy world um you know i think we as therapists you know i, I mean I, I can't give too many details but i mean i constantly have clients who present to me with physical symptoms that they feel are real um and they've had scans and everything else and nothing is going on. I mean, I'm thinking of one person who worked in finance and um, you know, they, there's definitely some TMJ stuff going on there, but they're convinced that their face is misaligned and, and you know, I've got a picture of them when they were younger and it looks the same to me. And, you know, and this person is, uh, earns a lot of money. Um, they always want a discount. They've never got enough money to pay <laughs> to pay me and they earn a fortune. And, you know, it's for me, I mean, I'm not a diagnostician, but, you know, I know enough to know that this is a psychological problem. You know, this person is working too hard. They've got stress from long hours in front of a computer. Um, and, um, and the fact that they earn a fortune, and I charge quite a lot of money, but they've got enough, <laughs> enough to pay 
and uh you know there's there's a lot of psychological stuff and you know as, as a therapist you know people open up to you when they're on the couch and it's like well, what do you say to them um you know getting drawn into some people's conversations can be really draining on you and it kind of can stay with you so you know the mhfa training i, I feel is, is so good for therapists you know one of the key things that we do is we learn listening skills um which unless you've done some psychotherapy training um, or something like that or some social work training or something you've probably never been trained in listening but i think we use it like 45 percent of the time I think maybe even a bit more. So, you know, listening is is really key. And then, you know, how do you listen? How do you kind of um, give someone the support that they need without kind of giving too much of yourself? And you know, are you doing the right thing? Are you are you qualified to say, well, maybe you should do this and maybe you should do that, and maybe you shouldn't? You know. So I think you know it's really so with the listening mm -hmm. to make it kind of applicable to people in the room, obviously hopefully everybody who is i mean no one's doing well no one in who follows um the guidelines of this association is doing close contact services because the government have clearly said no but in virtual consultations where we can listen and hopefully we're becoming better, better listeners because we're doing virtual consultations we're relying more on our ears and our hands and that sort of stuff what are some of the like what i asked in the introduction what are some of the triggers which this course and training helps you look out for when you know that rather than this person having a right to be stressed, like, I don't know, maybe his four year old urinated all over the kind of lounge carpet <laughs> a half an hour ago and he's stressed out because of that. How yeah. do you know where everyday life and just stress is just what you're listening to, or there's actually something where you should be acting, changing your tacts, thinking about referring on and that sort of thing? Well, I mean, the, the key thing with most mental health conditions is, um, you know, if something is the severity, the duration of, of what's going on and how it impacts their life. You know, if something's been going on for a while, you know, if someone's been really anxious for a while, like highly stressed, I mean, anxiety is just a manifestation of it stress if it's causing them problems if it's causing them physical problems if it's causing them relationship problems emotional problems um if they're it seems to be carrying on and on and on and they're not doing anything about it um then you know it's 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 good to to get this person to kind of think about it you know and, and to ask questions like do you know about anxiety do you know have you spoken to anyone about it or uh, we have this great thing uh, um, called the stress container, which uh, we use in mental health first aid training. So if you think, I call it the stress bucket. So if you think of a bucket and stress comes into the bucket and all your stresses is just the normal stuff, kids, finances, work, and you know, adding COVID and all these other things on top. Um, and then your bucket gets more and more full. And when it gets to the top, that's when you have this emotional snapping. So your emotional snapping, uh, this is like yeah, mental illness. It could be if it's really severe mental illness. It could just be shouting at the kids. It could be, I don't know, throwing something. And we call that the, the stress signature. So, you know, it's really good to be aware of that. Like for me, my stress signature is like, you know, my eye starts twitching, uh, which is really freaky. I start thinking about buying cars that I can never afford and I'd never want sat outside of my driveway because I just be scared of someone breaking into my house to steal it. Um, you know, stuff like that. So once you're aware of your stress signature, then you can kind of say, right, okay, I'm right at the top here. I need to do something about it. So at the bottom of this bucket, we've got like a, think of a little tap. And your little tap is the thing that lets all this stress out. So you have positive or helpful coping strategies. Uh, these could be things such as exercise is a great one, massage is a great one, reading, walking, connecting with friends, um, something like shopping, whatever, you know, something just nice, listening to music, arts, culture, all that kind of stuff. And then unhelpful coping strategies. Um, so drinking can be one of these things. Over-exercising could be one of these things. So we get people to, to think about that. And this is, I think, one of the really good tools that you can use with clients to say you know how to stress levels and that you know da, 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 da. you've been doing anything about that you know if they open up to you obviously about that it's, it's very easy to get people to look at that and i think now with covid it's really you know i say to people right think of your coping strategies think of ones that you lost 
because of COVID, you know, going to gym, even, you know, I pick up my kids from school. I'm not a big school gates person by any stretch, but I really miss it. And in the times in between that I've been able to do it, I've just been like, oh, talk to me, talk to me. You know, I've been, you know, I've been a, a, that person at the school gate. <laughs> it's like, you know, um, and we miss all these things, you know, and that, you know, COVID has had a massive, massive, massive effects on, on people's mental health. I think that the stats, so that's one in four people uh, in any year will experience poor mental health. And it's like 48% now. And that was in the report mm. before Christmas. So now with this further lockdown and the news that this could go on and on and on, despite the vaccines and everything, um, you know, it's, it's going to be worse and it's worse. Thank you. Yeah, I love, I love the bucket. <laughs> I think there's a gateway to the bucket. It's something which hopefully therapists have been using because when somebody comes in, it, there's very much a, it's very parallel here to pain education. Like when you read, um, some of the knowing pain stuff, the, the more modern version when they're talking about coping strategies and pluses and minuses and things. But we should be using the bucket because like so much of the cause of injuries because you've exceeded the thresholds. And, and already I think some therapists, particularly working with runners or something, you're already drawing that bucket saying, look, you're not sleeping. So that's coming out the tap or you're, you're, uh, you're still going out and trying to party and this sort of stuff. So the bucket's there. I don't think it yeah. should be too difficult to start the conversation by saying, oh, look how the stress is and stuff. But we had yeah. Bill Taylor in who was interesting. We were talking about male physical um, health. Um, and um, obviously the taboos of that, of getting your clients to open up about the fact of maybe, I don't know, erectile dysfunction or something, which they're not going to say, oh, by the way, something else, um, I have problems. But Bill said on the, on the medical park cues, rather than just saying, do you have um, you know, problems urinary incontinence or something? He said, ask a few more little specific questions because then at least if the client sees the question and they want to, if they can just put yes, that's almost an invitation to say, okay, I'm going to put yes here because I'm ready to talk about it. Yeah. There's some questions which you think therapists should be adding to those par cues, which would open the door a little bit, a little bit more specific about mental health and, and allowing that dialogue to happen, giving the people like a, an invitation to talk more during this objective yeah i think it, 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 absolutely there should be some very kind of open questions on there and you know just could be something simple like um how would you know how do you view your mental health do you have positive mental health um would you say that you feel anxious more often than not or you know there's it's very easy to actually start that dialogue and i think when people uh, you know, as you said, if that invitation is there to speak, people will often speak about that, and then that can, you know, unlock so much more. Uh, I work, I work for a company called uh, Body Space in uh, Knightsbridge, fixed space in Chelsea. So it's a high-end one-on-one personal training place, and I'm employed by them. I mean, they have some great physios and great sports therapists, and and I go in there, and my job nine times out of ten is to get them people to relax you know and get them to sleep better and and, and you know even though my, my treatments aren't I want to say actually relaxing um because um you know if people are less stressed you know they're gonna performance is gonna be better their recovery is gonna be better they're gonna get more out of their uh, sessions and there's a, maybe one or two athletes that go there but it's mostly you know wealthy people but i think it, it really rings true if people are happier in themselves mentally they're going to be happier in themselves physically you know, so, uh, I think. so we've got to go beyond a little bit i'm just imagining i wonder how many people in the room have actually got their little park you they give people or the pre-consultation form which just has how would you describe your stress levels on zero to ten that's probably as far as the question goes so that's probably because i know some people if they're they'll just say 10 because, oh, well, I've got a baby or my work is really stressful. But that's kind of where the conversation goes. I get the impression that a lot of therapists, when they see that, go, oh, pretty stressful. Okay. But we need some more questions, don't we? We need to yeah. therefore know what to say. And I suppose that's what the training for the MHFA is all about. That's it, yeah. And it's just, you know, to be able to start a dialogue and to be able to kind of listen to someone. And there's always the difficult thing as a therapist, I find it's like, you know, you don't want to get into that counseling thing, but you want to, to hear everything about it. But then also you've got someone in your room, they've come to you with a specific thing that they want sorted out and you've got a time frame. Um, so it, it, it's really difficult, but, um, but yeah, I think, you know, it's, um, to be able to ask someone and that, you know, that classic stress levels, naught to 10 and, uh, and just to be able to say, could you tell me more about that? 
you know, has this been going on for a while? Do you think it's got any effect on on what you're doing? You know, what you come here for? How about the scope of practice? I think that's something which we need to talk about because if you're opening up the floodgates and people are going to start telling you sensitive stuff, one, I want to know how do you know how to keep your boundaries? Where are those boundaries? And then two. Um, what about safeguarding? Are you responsible if you're seeing this person, even if they're an adult, to actually report something you might hear? Um, only report. I mean, if you think that person is uh, going to harm themselves or someone else, then confidentiality is out, you know. Um, but, you know, mental health first aid training is very clear. We're not diagnosticians. We're not therapists. Um, just with physical, as, as with physical first aid, you're there and till professional help comes you know so if someone comes to you and they're telling you this 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 and this and it's like wow that's have you spoken to someone about that you know have you got professional help you know um so we have this um uh, mnemonic just like physical first aid um algae and the e the first e is encourage professional supports and that's going to be gp community mental health team talking therapies you know if someone comes to you with something big you know you're there as a sports therapist a massage therapist or, or whatever your role is you know um even if you're a qualified counselor if they're not there for a counseling session you really need to be telling this to a professional and and then it, it teaches you the mhfa training teaches you about services that are available because a lot of people don't know about community mental health teams they don't know about iapt um, the second e in our training is to encourage other supports so that could be mental health charities um which in our country are often like first line mental health you know there's some of the biggest providers of mental health care um it could be bibliotherapy it could be reading apps are very good these days you know headspace is pretty good um relaxation stuff um you know if people are there's some actually some good tools on the nhs website where you can actually go in i, I send that to people quite a lot to say you know what's your anxiety level like what's your you know and it put in these little things and it'll tell you whether you think you should go and and speak to someone about that so if someone's a bit reticent to, to talk about it you can kind of show them this is available and you know with the, with the you know with that boundary setting it's like you know you have to be careful with yourself so one of the things we really practice is, is self-care and knowing what our limits are and um, because it's really really important that you don't overstep those um, those boundaries and, and that's really clear what you're there for and that's really to um to support someone um and then hopefully get them to see someone uh, professionally what's your strategy because this is opening a door to having people crying in your room isn't it which is something that younger therapists probably aren't that prepared for i try when i'm teaching therapists i think these days when you're producing new therapists and you're getting more important subjective and you're getting the important questions asked then you're more likely to have that first cry in your clinic and you need to be yeah. more prepared to know what to do um and especially if you work especially if you're working like you say people who have a tendency to over exercise which is what i've done when you get to the crutch of why they are exercising too much and normally it's because they're well not normally but a lot of the time it's because they're just hiding something else they're eclipsing it's an addiction like anything isn't it they're trying to yeah. drive out something else and then they'll open up about their marriage or their son or something or a death in the family and, and then the tears will come this is something obviously i imagine you prepare people for um, yeah. on the course yeah. Um, is it something which is like naturally it's going to happen it's going to happen or have you taken the wrong route to suddenly they've just started what work to come on and they've kind of kind of let out is there ways to avoid that or is it something um, um, those questions i think it's every every situation is is you know you have to treat that as a an, an individual situation it's always going to be different every time um so you never know how people are going to respond but you know i think these are questions that really need to be asked um, but then, you know, in that, I'm saying that sometimes it might not be appropriate to answer, answer that. If you, if someone's in front of you and you don't feel emotionally capable to deal with a possible outburst that they might have because you feel that there might be something going on, but you feel I'm not ready for this. I can't. Then, you know, it might be speaking to someone else about it to approach that person. You know, so um, so. Cool. Where do you go? 
I've just got so many questions I'm thinking now as you're talking, but I need to <laughs> also got to fit in other people's questions. I will get to you people there. I'm just zoning in on James. Norman. Yeah, you continue. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so yeah, I think you have to be really, you know, you have to be prepared for that. You have to be kind of ready for it and it's okay to be upset. You know, it's, if, if these things that if someone's like saying something to you and they've not talked about it before and they're going to cry, it's okay for them to cry. It's okay for you to be there when they're crying, you know. So we do uh, in our training, we do crisis first uh, aid for major uh, mental health uh, conditions that are prevalent in society. And it kind of teaches you kind of, yeah, how to react in that situation. I mean, the, one of the main things is learning how to listen and just to be comfortable with someone pulling their heart out without feeling that you have to fix that, that you have to respond to it. Uh, because often we, you know, we naturally do that. You know, if someone tells us, oh, oh, this happened to me and that happened to me, you want to kind of, oh, well, you know, this is all right and don't worry about that. And that's a kind of nice, friendly thing to do. But this is when you overstep that boundary and then you become emotionally involved in that. So it kind you know of teaches. What are some no nos? Like I'm imagining straight away. The trouble is if you give someone, if they have the impression that they're empowered now to actually really help, because most therapists are very altruistic. We're in this game, not for the money. It's because you want to yeah, help yeah, others. Yeah. So I, I think there's always going to be this danger there of giving people the belief to let more of this kind of altruism out. And the idea of if someone start crying to think, well, I've done my course now, I can give them a hug. I've got to put your head on my shoulder. But straight away, you're entering a territory which could be disastrous for both you and the patient, I imagine. So what are some other no-nos like physical contact, I imagine? What other things should you watch out for? Do you learn on the course? Um, I, I think it's just that whole boundary setting and um, and knowing what your role is, you know, and being really clear in that. I mean, if you feel that you, you want to give someone a hug, you can give someone a hug for sure. But, I mean, generally, uh, you wouldn't do that. You know, but, uh, physical contact is is, is uh, definitely a no-no unless it's obviously inviting. If you know that person, it's, it's kind of a different thing. Um, and and yeah, and really, you know, I think the, one of the the worst things that you can do is to kind of put your judgments onto someone else and and give them wrong, potentially wrong advice. You know, because that way you really become involved in it. Um, so it's good to be clear. You know it's really great that you told me that i'm really happy that you did this must be hard for you to do that have you spoken to anyone professionally about it do you know what services are available can i give you some numbers and um can you get back you know and you know if you if you're involved with that person and, and you're friends with them or they're a client of yours and there is some obviously there's always going to be some emotional involvement with regular clients because obviously you care for these people um mm. But it's keeping that clear barrier to this is my professional life and, you know, and I can help you as a professional because, you know, their mental health is, you know, mental health and physical health are completely intertwined. You know, you can't separate the two. I think if someone comes to you, obviously, with a physical thing, but then comes up with some uh, mental problems, and especially if you think it's going to be impacting their physical health or their health in general, which it will, um, I think we've got a duty of care to, to um so just signpost um, what's available for these people and, and to help them help them get that professional help that they they may need so fantastic right there's loads of questions i want but i have to remember it's not just me and you in here there's some other people here right so we've got some questions let's turn it's uh thank you for that so so much information and um yeah i'm going to turn to the people now becky here has got a question i think we're going to turn a little bit more to the therapist um, Becky Carroll says, I'll read it out for people listening to the podcast. Um, any advice on how to decompress ourselves as therapists? We can often take our clients' anxieties and worries home with us. Any tips on how to leave it at work, so to speak? Good question, Becky. It's a really good question, and it's it's a very difficult one. I mean, I, 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 mean, I don't want to get to unicorns and rainbows, but I kind of, you know, I feel like I'm a little bit of an empath sometimes, and, you know, someone can see me with, uh, I don't know, some sciatica type symptoms and I, I can't go home and I'm like, what's this about? Um, but on the emotional level, you know, again, it's just about keeping those boundaries. And I think once you, you kind of, if you set them with yourself and you're clear and you know that you've done exactly what was right for you, even if you know and you're worried about that person or whatever, you know, that you can only do so much, you know, you can't 
take on someone else's emotional stuff and you can't be responsible for other people's emotions all you can do is really be responsible for for yourself in that so i think for me uh in my work because i work with a lot of uh very ill people who i i get to care about you know i really get to care about them so it's kind of it's hard to do that but uh, you know for me again if if uh <clears throat> for example the company that i work for now or in between lockdown uh, i'm working with someone who's got psychosis um very ill they've been in nightingale hospitals very expensive and um and this person you know i really care about this person and she's often trying to open up to me and and i'm like no you know we can't do this it's like you know this is for your therapist or psychiatrist you know so it's it's really important when you know to have that no 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 you know i'm glad you told me this but you know really um this isn't in my scope so and you know for me uh, you know a nice salty bath a bit of yoga lots of eggs and salt <laughs> a nice box set some chocolate um and uh yeah <laughs> yeah she can, somebody I never hand out your mobile number i guess just what you <laughs> start doing just think oh yeah. God, i think it'd be cool if you need some help later on or oh, that can open up pandora's box of problems can't it yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Tricky um good question becky what else we got in here let me have a look um stevie Barr says i uh, was on a webinar with ruby wax recently such so an interesting hour around her mental health issues and how she deals with them if mm -hmm. you ever get the opportunity to watch her i'd recommend it yeah yeah she's great yeah she's so there's great. pros and cons isn't there i think sometimes some people have really helped the debate about mental health by coming out especially if they're celebrities of some form but i think sometimes on the media it helps distort the truth when you get some people coming out with their revelation is the kind of thing i'm sure this is just for kind of hello or okay magazine and i think yeah as always it can help or cloud the issue mm -hmm. um, nicholas smith says i always try to sign but ruby wax is great i was having a go ruby then no no no, no she's yeah. wonderful ruby. i met her once actually really i actually met her when i was at the core trust which is in marley bone and she was in there's a chip shop around the corner uh, what's it called? Oh my God, I can't remember the name, but it's one of the best fish and chip shops in the world. And actually, I'm vegetarian. It actually does vegetarian chips. I actually cook the chips separately. Um, and it's got this posh fish restaurant next to it. So I walk in there with this guy who was, uh, I was in rehab with, and he is very camp, like handlebar moustache. He's like, great. We walk in there, Ruby Wax and uh, Liza Minnelli are behind the counter and they're filming this thing. So of course, my friend was like, whoa! You know, it, was, it was amazing so yeah the ruby lap wax and Liza Melly served as chips so that's that must be the quiet uh, corner that was pretty good <laughs> yeah <laughs> i imagine uh, nicholas smith says yeah i wanted to ask you about this as well so i'm glad nicholas says i always try to signpost people to local services if i feel like my depth in regards to mental health um so nicholas fortunate there's a psychotherapist at my place of work i guess mm. this is where people who or you i think you've already said you learn it on the course how to network and refer out yeah. but these days people's soft tissue therapists really should have that in their in their phone book shouldn't they they should have the cards they should have people already that they can refer to if they hear certain triggers yeah. is that something which most centers you know are welcome if if soft tissue therapists got in contact with their local kind of mental health center would they respond and say i oh, know thanks yeah. for letting us know and yeah they'd be happy to and uh you know uh, a lot of local charities are really good places to start as well mind is, is excellent mm. we think are really good as well and they will offer if you're unsure you can have a quick chat with them so i'm a therapist i often get people who come to me with mental health problems would it be okay to point them in your direction and they'd be great because they will know all the different services and, and who they should go to and they can actually refer on to gps and or other mental health services too so, so and i guess it could work both ways looking at a business thing because when we're out of covid and we can do close contact but we know the one thing that that research does support is the benefits of massage for anxiety depression and the mental health so it could be a great way again of helping your business um keep its head above water by getting yeah. referrals back good question yeah Nicola. yeah um sue what have you said here sue said i have on my client assessment forms and um, that everything between us uh, are confidential but if they do tell me something which i feel they could harm themselves i have a duty of care to inform their gp occupational health you do. they sign to agree this right yeah but okay. you don't need their signature you're saying that if they say something which sounds like they could harm themselves or someone at home yeah you can get the confidentiality out the window is it even out the window definitely yeah definitely so. okay fine 
Um, good question, Sue. Yeah, definitely. I, I love it when we get guests on like yourself here. It happened with Bill as well. Everyone's going to go home now and start modifying their parkour, their middle question form, and start adding things in and checking it. It's good. Self-reflection. Um, let's have a look at what Corrine McCree has said down here. It's important to network in our local area with other professionals and have some names, charities, helplines to suggest to clients who show MH issues. Definitely, yeah. It's an important part of that networking, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Cool. Um, right, people, if you think of any other questions specifically for James, and I'll give you a moment now. Oh, that was quick. Sana Sports Massage says, um, how would you support the clients you know need mental health support during lockdown? Uh, sometimes a treatment in their space. Uh, is there space to offload? Oh, yeah. Is there space to offload? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, this can be, it's very difficult. Um, there are, I suppose you could um, signpost them to um, other services that they could use. Um, there's talking therapies that are available. There's IAPS is one good thing that the government have been doing recently, which is access to, to psychological therapies. Um, and just get them to, to get whatever help that they can and encourage them to get out and go running or go for a walk or do whatever they can uh, and find some other coping strategies, some other positive coping strategies. Because, you know, again, this is, is a really good question, Sana, because people really do rely on therapists for that really that is a it's a big positive coping strategy which people can't can't have you know i mean i've just bought another theragun uh which, which uh, much quieter there's no it's no substitute for a good therapist uh but it helps you know if you've got some physical thing it's good to do that there's lots of self-massage uh videos on on youtube i've got some on my uh, youtube channel and make sure they've got a foam roller, make sure they're just doing something else, you know, some other positive thing um, that they can do to, to help relieve um, any emotional um, stress that they're under and discomfort. It's tricky, the power of human touch, isn't it? Especially if they yeah. by themselves, uh, yeah. maybe if they're visually impaired or something, it could be the only contact they get. It's a tricky one, a lot of people suffering. But yeah, like Gary said, chatting informally over the phone can be really helpful. Sometimes yeah. the conversation might not replace it, but it might show them uh, another angle of offloading, like you say, that they hadn't considered before. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, yeah, any other questions? Bring them through now, because we are slightly running out of time. So what about um, for the people who are interested in more information about MHFA, how long is the course? Is it running at the moment? Can you do it online? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we've got online courses running at the moment. The Mental Health First Aid Certificate, uh, uh, which Matt uh, did with me, Matt Scarsbrook, that's um, it's normally a two-day course in person. Online, it's four days, and it's split over um, four sessions. Um, they're normally about two and a half hours each, sometimes a bit less. So we'll run two of those a week, so spread over two weeks. Um, so it's, it's quite manageable. There's some um, learning that you do at home as well. So it's, it's online stuff you can do and some workbook activities. Um, so we've got that course. We've got also a one day course, um, which is more for, um, it's more work orientated. And then we've got a half day course, which is um, a mental health awareness course, which is a good introduction if you're not sure whether you want to do uh, the certificate at the moment. Um, so there are links to these, sorry, there links to these on your website. Links to those on the website. So upcoming courses, all about the mind.com. Um, some people yeah. are asking so yeah there we go it's all about the mind all one word.com if you listen to the podcast there's a screenshot um on the page here that's um, it and we've we've got 50 percent off at the moment so you can have 50 percent off all of our courses that we've got listed uh if you use the code jan 50 and that's not i think we've got that on our social but it's not on the website and we're not advertising that uh big so if you use jan 50 uh you can send me a mess message and if Obviously, anyone else that you want to reach out to you think would know this, they can uh, use that code as well. Because I, I think it's really important as a therapist myself um, that we get it out to this community. I think it's, it's, it's to as many people as possible, really. So the, the one I'm running at the moment is fully booked. 
I think everyone on it was a therapist of some sort or a therapist in training, a yoga teacher. There was a professional athlete there, actually, at uh, national level too, but also just did the, the sports massage training. Um, so actually, it's really good because I can give uh, examples of where I've had people have panic attacks, for example, or people that come to me with psychological issues and, and, and give examples of that in, in my uh, setting. As a, as a um, massage uh, professional so fantastic so well there's a few people there already interested so Brilliant. um this lot are trying to, i can't <laughs> use that word on social media this lot uh, they love posting links and helping other people they're a very altruistic bunch oh, about, so uh, they'll be oh. spreading the good word i'm sure um <laughs> and if they want to talk to you personally are you active on one of the particular platforms was it better off emailing you or what's the best way um email is probably uh the best um yeah i'm still even though i worked in it for a long time i'm a bit of a fun <laughs> <laughs> what is your email address james <laughs> uh james at allaboutthemind.com if you want to email me if you've got any questions or any queries about it it's, it's, it's on the website and, uh, yeah. at myself in the chat so it'll be there forever now that was me typing that james Brilliant. at oh no that's spelled wrong get rid of that delete it somebody i've put an i've oh my god my spelling i've missed that an l there you go ignore me um brilliant like james that. thank you so much um it's a weird question obviously because we don't know what's going to happen um in the next few months but what have you you've got the online courses anything else coming up for you which is um interesting in the next few months well i'm writing i'm um, working on a film script actually <laughs> i'm working <laughs> on a film script yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the last lockdown, I wrote a short film and it was picked up by a producer and she wants to turn it into a feature film. So I'm trying to do that. Are you allowed to give uh, us the scoop of what it's on? Is it to do with mental health or? It's, to, it it's, to, it's to do with racism, actually. It's to oh, do okay. with uh, like a, my growing up and, and that kind of whole 80s vibe. But it should be interesting. She's an award-winning producer, so um, it should be good. It should be good. But I've got to write the bloody thing first, which is difficult with homeschooling, doing this, kids, everything else. I'm also working working on some anti-racism training as well um and and trying to support my wife as well as a writer too <laughs> so yeah, very busy yeah very busy i'm also learning the harmonica as well which is great oh, what else can, what else can you add to the equation? how's your stress bucket how are you doing with the tap how's it going might have worked uh, with my wife it's I pretty the good. harmonica helps empty it, does it yeah, a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all about, I mean, you know, it's all about recognizing the signs, recognizing the triggers, you know, knowing when you're about to like, eh, and then doing something else, you know. Uh, so, you know, thankfully I've been in this field for a long time. So I picked up a lot of really good uh, coping strategies. You know, I meditate every day, do yoga every day uh, when I can. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I make sure that I, I stay nourished emotionally basically i've got a really supportive wife and i've got great kids who are amazing um and very stressful at the same time <laughs> yeah, totally. but it's like stress coping mechanisms stress <laughs> but yeah so it's all keep me sane, which is great fantastic well so thank you so much for your time um thank you it's a pleasure if everybody like i say ignore the email address i put in there but the proper email list is there if you want to talk to james and all the information is um all about the mind dot it's a dot com isn't it if I remember yeah. right uh, which actor is playing me i would say i would say it might be idris but i don't want to give anything away <laughs> <laughs> and remember there is a discount on there as well um if you sign up in in does it have to be signed up in january you say yeah january? It, does, it, it does have to be signed up in january yes, but there you um go. Yeah, wonderful stuff. So thank you, everyone, uh, for your lovely, positive messages as well. And uh, thank you very much, Matt and uh, STA, for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Right, people. Well, there we go. Um, I hope there's some good information for you there. As always, um, we're going to start doing some follow-ups kind of in, in the month time, James. It'll be interesting to hear about um, how your film score is going and who you've got playing mm -hmm. yourself. Oh, I now I think I understand why Brux brian huxley suddenly put denzel washington denzel washington <laughs> yeah, i'm not that old get it i'm trying to work out why is he putting denzel washington in the yeah i'm not that old <laughs> thanks you're brian i'll be trying younger to <laughs> i was gonna say we're trying to work out who will play right fantastic thanks mate uh people we don't know who's on next week i have to touch to gary about that but we will be back at tuesday um at eight o'clock again um oh yeah i have to have a shout out for idris down here we go 
yeah, yeah. yeah well, we'll leave on that comment um yeah. brilliant right james thank you so much for joining us again and uh, oh. everybody will see you next tuesday um, at eight o'clock on the sports therapy association podcast thanks so much see you soon thank you very much thank you everybody.